Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Eric Głowacki, and he is the research group leader at SciTech in Brno, Czech Republic, and SciTech stands for Oh, no, I lost it. <laughs> what does it stand for again? <laughs> uh, Central European Institute of Technology. Central Institute European. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, he also puts together the, the BioL uh, conference, helps put that together, uh, which is kind of a Gordon Research Conference in, in Europe. It was really cool. And uh, it's it's amazing stuff because uh, I actually hadn't heard about you. Uh, you you kind of came out of nowhere because I guess you've been working on uh, solar cells for the last decade and, and have recently gone into neurotech. But at SciTech, you guys actually are starting to do, I guess, contract manufacturing a little bit and helping work with poly amid perylene, silicon devices, and design and everything like this. So yeah, it's really cool stuff. And then very astute listeners may have heard that recently the last few episodes have been sponsored by the same SciTech Nano. And so you've been sponsoring the, the episode. So so Mr. Sponsor, do you want to do you want to talk about you yourself, what your what your institute does? Well, that was a very kind introduction and, and very thorough. And thanks a lot for for having me on. And it's it's of course an honor to to sponsor your fine show. It's something that I prescribe to all my coworkers and, and students to, to listen to your show. It's a great introduction to the field. But yeah, it's just like you say, I mean, I'm coming from a material science background. So indeed, I, I, did, I worked in organic light emitting diode technology and, and solar cell technology for quite some time. That's what I did my, my work during undergrad and, and PhD studies on. And after finishing PhD in 2013, it was already clear that, you know, the organic light emitting diode technology was very, very mature. You know, you have it in your, in your phones. Lots of people use it. It's a nice success story. And with organic solar cells, it wasn't really clear that there was going to be a real breakthrough there in 2013. And well, you know, spoiler alert, it didn't, it didn't really work out for organic solar cells. But anyway, after finishing PhD, I, I wanted, you know, I, I was looking for something else to do. And Indeed, I just kind of got in with the wrong crowd and started working with some people who are electrophysiologists. And it's something that I really, really liked. And by 2014, 2015, we started to put together the two worlds of electrophysiology and, and the solar cells, right? So the idea was to have semiconductor, thin film, ultra thin solar cells, basically, for neurostimulation. And that, ha that was my introduction to the field of, of neural interfaces. And it remains one of the main topics that I'm really interested in and, and, and working with with several people to do photovoltaic transcutaneous neural stimulation. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's talk about this more. Photovoltaic transcutaneous neurostimulation. What does that mean? And, and yeah, what are the detail, details of that? Yeah. So in implantable neuromodulation technologies, everyone's trying to make things as small and minimally invasive as possible. That's that's what a lot of people work on. There's a lot of beautiful work out there with wireless power transfer. And there are many approaches ranging from various magne uh, magnetic induction, electromagnetic induction type technologies to ul focused ultrasound. And what we have been doing is basically relying on light to get through tissue in order to reach an implant. And that might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but the fact is, is that there are wavelengths of light where both soft tissue and bone are relatively transparent. So we're talking about the red and near infrared region of the spectrum. So between about 600 and 800, 900 nanometers, these are, this is a kind of window where you can get quite high power densities through several centimeters of tissue in, in a safe way. And what we've been doing is, is, is utilizing that to basically power an implantable neurostimulator. And the implanted neurostimulators that we make are essentially a solar cell that is directly coupled to neurostimulation electrodes. So if you take a modulated light pulse, that modulated light pulse will be converted by this device directly into a biphasic neurostimulation impulse. So it's a way to make a very minimalistic uh, stimulator that's extremely small and indeed it's transcutaneous. I mean, we've used the, we've done this on for, for transcranial. So stimulation of the surface of the brain, as well as various peripheral nerves. And we're at the stage of doing longer and longer animal experiments to really prove that this technology is safe and effective for long periods of time. And that's of course the, the stepping stone to moving towards clinical 
translatability. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. So yeah, the infrared and deep infrared is, you know, mostly uh, related to heat and everything like this. The, is there a heat issue? And then also another thing, how how does this compare to other wireless uh, power transmissions such as, you know, ultrasonics, magnetic, uh, anything else? Yeah, so both both very good questions. Maybe I'll start with the, with, with, with the first part, with the heat, right? So of course, if you start dissipating energy into, into tissue, you, you will get some heating and it's very important to be, be mindful of that. So we try to, we don't try, we do stay within the, the accepted standards for skin and tissue exposure to light in order to not create heating. So fortunately, there is a lot of work because of medical imaging, for example, there is a lot of work about light interaction of tissue. So you can easily calculate and you can easily measure how much heat is actually being, being dissipated. So the general rule of thumb is you never want to have any heating beyond one or two degrees of, of the tissue. But what I can say is for an, the applications that we're doing, where we're stimulating nerves that are about one centimeter below the skin, and we're using LED light sources with a relatively low duty cycle, uh, you don't feel anything. So, I mean, you, there really is no heating element. And in the papers that we published, we've done very careful control studies to show that it's not a photothermal effect of stimulation. The, the, that can also, that's also something that people do, right? You can hit neurons with very fast temperature, photothermal temperature increases to get them to, to fire action potentials. That's not what this is. This is orders of magnitude, lower, lower energy, and it's indeed a true photovoltaic transduction mechanism. So I, I think that covers the heat. But the other important thing is, yeah, how does this compare to all the other cool ideas that are that are out there? I think that one of the big advantages is that the the actual implant can be really, 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 really small. So the efficiency of this device is quite high. It's easy to have a device that is just a few millimeters in cross-sectional area that absorbs enough light to to stimulate relatively, relatively large peripheral nerves. So you, you you have your receiving element is really really tiny. So that's a big advantage over a lot of the inductive technologies that are out there. The other thing is that, you know, with focused ultrasound, for example, also you can have very small transductors, but you need to have intimate contact of the transmitter on the skin. With the light, the advantage is the transmitter doesn't have to touch the skin. You know, it can be, it's an LED uh, light source, which you can just very roughly, very crudely place above your area of interest. And that leads me to the final uh, advantage, which is... Um, how easy it is to, to align. So alignment is easy because it's super cheap and super easy to get large LED light sources. You can just buy stuff on the internet, uh, very simple red LED arrays. So you don't have to bother with aiming because you just put this, this light source roughly over the area of interest and, and you, you hit the target without having to try very hard. So I think that's an advantage. That's pretty cool. What kind of light density would you need? Like would, for example, going outside and, uh, you know, taking off a hat or something like yeah. this, and, and would that be enough to power it? Definitely not. So you need, you need, you need to have about 10 to 100 times higher light intensities than what sunlight coming through the skin would cause. But the main reason why just ambient light exposure doesn't cause stimulation is because the light is not modulated, right? So if you just have the sun shining on, on, on your head, if something is coming through, it would give you maybe a very small DC offset on the, on the stimulator. But what the, the light source is modulated. So if, if we want to deliver, you know, a 10 Hertz uh, stimulation signal, we're going to have a 10 Hertz on off light pulse and the light pulse is directly converted into an electrical impulse. Okay. Yeah. I guess you could have some kind of like almost like a LCD display or something like this, and that could modulate it on the outside, but in that case might as well just have the lights, but, but yeah, that is, that is really cool. Okay. So, so let's talk about how did you get into, you know, neurotech? Like I said, I hadn't really seen, I mean, you, you were publishing more in different, different things recently. So yeah, I want to hear your career arc. It was pretty interesting when we talked about it before. Okay. Yeah. The career arc. So, so yeah, I mean, I started in, in this material science, right. And, and really organic semiconductor technology. So LE, OLED and OPV. And in 2013, I, I really got to the point where I thought, well, I don't really see like a huge future here that I, you know, it doesn't feel very, very stimulating the, this area. And by chance, I just, I just started to work more in electrophysiology with, with people who were at my campus, you know, doing electrophysiology and that, they pulled me in, you know, I, I got more and more into this. So since 2015, I would say I've been fully on the bioelectronics, let's say trajectory. 
And the career arc was that, yeah, I mean, we the first big breakthrough was this photovoltaic stimulation in the context of retina, which was which is remains a very interesting area. And because of some success that we had in terms of patent and, and publications, I got an, a job offer in Sweden in 2016. And I moved to Sweden to start a research group there for, for a few years. And we were able to really, you know, get into clean room microfabrication, which again is leveraging some of the background that I had with, with the thin film displays, right? And the thin film solar cells. A lot of the technology is the same, lithography is lithography. So we started to get into that in Sweden. And there, you know, we did more and more of the, the flexible stuff. So 2017, first Paraline deposition tool. So I got into got into playing around with with Paraline C and, and 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 different formulations of Paraline actually, and trying to do different types of creative lithography steps on on Paraline devices. And we've been doing that ever since. In 2020, I moved to Bernal here in the Czech Republic, attracted in large part by this relatively new center, which is called Say Tech Nano, where it's just a very 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 fancy, very nice clean room with excellent access policies and some nice equipment. So the point was, was that we were able to also with some European money to set up quite a nice um, set of processes for making flexible, flexible neural tech devices. And that's basically what we've been up to for the past couple of years. So yeah, the photovoltaic technology is our, one of the main things, right? But we play around with trying to answer all kinds of basic questions in neuroscience and electrophysiology by making the right you know, micro scaled tools to answer some questions. Yeah, that is interesting. I actually didn't realize there was such an overlap between, you know, solar cells and, you know, neurotech. I, I know there is one material you probably have worked with. I think, I think it was in one of your papers was P.PSS that that's definitely used in both. And mm -hmm. that that's the only overlap that I've seen like explicitly, but yeah. So, so, okay. So you started working with these materials, polyamide, perylene, everything like this. Do you want to talk about these materials, introduce them, talk about why they're advantageous and, and I guess what kind of experience you have with them too? Yeah, sure. So yeah, perylene and polyamide, these, these two terms came up so far a couple of times. So these are basically engineering plastics. These are so-called high-performance engineering, engineering plastics, which you can make in a clean room environment. And what makes them special and sets them aside from other plastics is that you can really process them and change their shape and, and manipulate them using various microfabrication procedures. Microfabrication, usually I'm thinking, you know, lithography, but not only, also laser processing and so on. So the point is, is that we can do micro machining on these plastics on a wafer scale using semiconductor processes. And that's what's really important. So if we kind of just take a step back and look at, you know, bioelectronic devices, right? You can kind of look back that most of the stuff that's in humans that's used in clinic today, this is kind of the first generation of stuff where you have some platinum meridium wire that is basically hand made by some expert craftsmen and is encapsulated in some kind of silicone rubber. And then this thing is implanted into the human, right? And then kind of the, the next generation of technologies are microfabricated technologies based on silicon, right? So stuff like the Utah array, stuff like the Michigan probe, that's where people realized, ah, you know, we should be using these very advanced, mature um, semiconductor processes to make neural probes instead of making these things, you know, by hand. So that's like the next step. And then the third step is taking it one step further from silicon and microfabricating things on plastics to make them even thinner and even more you know, flexible and uh, conformable. So that's where perylene and polyamide come in. So maybe quickly I'll say like, what are the advantages and disadvantages of both of them, right? So perylene has the advantage that it, it has a pretty well-established track record in biomedical devices. So it's part. It's used to passivate stents. It's used to coat stuff like uh, implantable pulse generators, cardiac, you know, simulators and stuff like that. So it's been around in biomedically approved devices for a long time now, and it has pretty good profile for safety. And you can make it in a clean room environment in in a very high quality. Uh, the big disadvantage is that it doesn't have a very good thermal budget. So. You cannot, re it's difficult to do processes that, that cause heating of the perylene without causing warping or, or damage of some kind. So you're, you cannot do all the different kinds of processes on it easily because it simply doesn't stand higher temperatures. So then on the other hand, you have polyimid. 
And polyimide is, is a solution process polymer that's manufactured by many, many large chemical companies that you can also use in the clean room. And the advantage there is that it has much higher thermal budget. You can easily do processes that exceed 200 or 300 degrees on the polyimide. And that's great. But the issue is, is that still in terms of the regulation let's say, of biomedical devices, the story of polyimide is the jury is still out, right? I mean, I think that it's more like it's there's it should be safe, but the large companies that make polyimide, I mean, they it's a liability issue, of course, right? So there's still the acceptance of polyimide as a biomedical implant polymer is something that a lot of people are working on, on getting, getting, you know, pushed forward, but it's not something that's as established as as, poly, as perylene C. So for that reason, perylene C has a little bit of a edge in the regulatory aspect, but I would say that polyimide has a lot of advantages from a microfabrication point of view. Yeah, for sure. They, they definitely, um, they're, they're quite similar, yeah, I would say. And this is this is something that I work on in, in uh, my lab and, you know, in, in the in part of my PhD in the in the Judy lab at University of Florida. So uh, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear you, you know, talk about this. Um, and now a word from our sponsor. SciTech Nano provides custom solutions for neural interface hardware design, development, fabrication, and testing. SciTech Nano specializes in microfabrication in perylene and polyamide, thin film ceramics, and conducting polymers. If you need custom neural interface hardware made with quality at an affordable price, you should contact SciTech Nano in the heart of Central Europe in Brno, Czech Republic. Now, back to the show. Okay, so so you're also offering now a service to to other labs and everything, right? To, to be able to make them make these devices for them, including silicon devices. Is it hard to make these? Why why are you offering this? I guess what kind of skills do you have? What kind of skills do you and your team have? And yeah, I guess I guess talk about your services a little bit too. Okay, yeah. So so the, the framework of what, what I mean by services, I mean we're we are a, a public institution, you know, we're we're, we're a research group at a, at a at a university, so to say. But I don't know how it is in the States, but in Europe, right, it's quite common for universities to do what's called contract research. So basically to provide a you know measurement services or or basically some kind of some kind of know-how to to private entities as well for a certain price, right? But what's special uh, here in the Czech Republic, and especially at Satec, is that the overheads are rel- are very low for for such for such company contracts. So you it actually it's it's quite good to run a research group not only from grants from public grants, but really to fuel a research group a lot from from basically working with companies. And the motivation for that is not only to just you know mercenary to to basically fund our research group, but it allows us to get our know-how into some pretty cool projects. You know, there's companies out there that do very cool things. And the fact that we can contribute by applying, you know, experience on perylene or polyimide in order to help someone, you know, achieve achieve an interesting goal is, is of course, highly motivating. And yeah, so the key know-how, I would say, is, is all of these lithographical processes and patterning processes on, yeah, silicon, sure, conventional silicon, we got that down, but for polyimide and perylene, I would say we're, we're also very, very good. And we have a lot of processes that combine ceramic materials with perylene and polyimide, which not only helps us to control the mechanical properties of these implants, but also opens up a lot of very cool microfab steps that you cannot just go off and do on just plastic, right? So we can make some pretty, fa- pretty fancy structures. And uh, yeah, so that's something that's new. I mean, this is not in the past half year or so we've kind of op- we've opened up to doing this more and more. And the reason we're opening up to doing it more and more is because we see that there's interest, there's demand, and it's highly motivating for us. And, you know, PhD students who are finishing, they're very happy to, to stick around and, and, and work on this type of stuff. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, okay, so what does the process look like? Let's say a lab is interested. Maybe they don't know exactly what kind of design. I mean, is that something you can help with as a design? Mm-hmm. And then the manufacturing, how long does something like that take? And I don't know, are there iterations? What has maybe previous collaborations looked like? Yeah, so so look, I mean, there's many different flavors, right? So on one side, we have companies that have a very specific thing, microfabricated array, for example, that they want, right? They already have the design right? They they want something very specific and they will basically send us the, 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 the layout. We will produce photo masks. Uh, we produce photo masks in-house, of course. 
and then we will uh, we will make it and send it to them. And you know, there are some contracts that we have where it's really quite bulk. You know, they want many, many, many of these of these probes. Uh, but on the other hand, we've had a lot of companies also where they don't really know they don't have the layout, they don't have the design. They have an application. You know, they 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 have, they have something specific they want to achieve. And we help to do the design and and figure out how to make it and then go through the iterations. And we have much more of the second category, you know, much more of those kinds of examples where where we have some of our PhD and postdocs, you know, they're really into helping out with these iterative steps of developing new prototypes and then producing them. But yeah, and the turnaround time, I mean, depends a lot on on what kind of device we're talking about, right? So, I mean, most of the time we're we're pretty fast. I mean, from from if, if someone sends us a design, we can print photo masks in a, in a day or two, depending on how many layers, of course, maybe that's the slowest step, of course, printing photo masks, right? But then the actual processing steps, I mean, we, we have things done in a couple of weeks usually, and some of the customers are partners, you know, they, they want also a lot of testing as well. So that's also something we can basically provide a series of devices with a report that, okay, here's how it works and here's how you measure it. Yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, that's a that's pretty incredible. I mean, that that sounds like a really fast turnaround time. I've heard horror stories, uh, you know, labs I've worked in that that you know a year or two later they're they're still waiting mm-hmm. on certain things coming in, and you know, communication isn't that that good. So you know, the the fact that you even mentioned like oh turnaround time of one day to make the masks that's that's you know mind blowing. That that's literally orders of magnitude faster than than other things. So yeah, that that's pretty exciting. And then. And then I think another exciting thing, I think you said that the the overhead is pretty low. Yeah. Obviously, you're you're based in Czech Republic, so it's cheaper than, you know, a Belgium or a US or something like this. Can you talk about the prices and difference, price differences or is that something that's not something that you really focus on? Yeah, I mean, what what I what I meant by overhead, right? I mean, I, I I was thinking more of the fact that like in most universities, if you have a company contract, the university takes a pretty big cut of that. Right, something on on the to the tune of forty percent or more. Uh, here, that number is much smaller, something like ten percent or less. Right, and that's not about the Czech Republic being, let's say, having lower running costs than Belgium. Right, although that's also true. It's more about a, a political decision that they really want the research groups to to work with companies more and to incentivize that they basically don't take such a big cut, right, and allow the research groups to to use that money to fund. The research groups, right? So that's that, that's what I meant there. But as as far as like running costs and salaries and things like that, I mean, just to quickly comment, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, the Czech Republic is, is a country which is you know former Eastern Europe, of course. But you know, the the gap in terms of wages and costs is rapidly rapidly converging. So I mean, if you if you look at the difference in you know, salaries compared to, you know, Sweden, for example, which I, which I know well, or, you know, neighboring countries like, like Austria or Germany, it's not that much lower anymore. And the running costs are not that much lower. So it's, you know, the, 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 that's been, that's been converging a lot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, I remember horror stories, you know, back in the day and Czech, I guess, PhD students or, you know, Mm -hmm. postdocs or something making like, you know, 600 a month or something like this. So it's like, woof, because yeah, that, that'd be, that would be a hard life. Okay. So this is something that you uh, offer to labs for research purposes. Have you thought about opening it up to companies and neurotech companies? Is this something that that's in the cards as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the the, the 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 people we work with are primarily neural tech neural tech companies, right? The issue is is that the devices that we make, you know, don't have the certification to you know the ISO certification for for clinical right work. But there's plenty of neural tech companies that want lots of stuff for animal work, right? So we have no problem. There's no problem there. What I'm very 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 intent on pushing, I've been working on, is to to be able to get the ISO certification for part of our clean room, that we will be able to do that. And one of the key elements to make that happen is to be able to present to the local politicians that, I mean, here we have interest in companies. Companies are coming to us. We have know-how. We're able to manufacture stuff at a high level. We're able to design cool devices at a high level, uh, but we cannot move beyond animals, right? So I'm in the process of Trying, trying to push that. But yeah, the current state of affairs is, yeah, neural tech companies are our main partners. But yeah, cl- we have to draw the line at clinical, unfortunately. 
Yeah, that's that'd be pretty pretty exciting stuff. And then you were talking about the bulk orders. Yeah, you might have to <laughs> order the thousand or ten thousand or something like this. W- mm-hmm. Would you be able to do something like that? I, oof, I mean, I guess I, I guess so. I mean, it depends what it is, right? I mean, <laughs> if we're talking about a bunch of small brain probes where there's a hundred per wafer, <laughs> then I think that's that's not a problem. If we're talking about some very very large probes for spinal cord or something like that, yeah, that can be. I would say it's a, it's it's not so easy. So the turnaround time will be longer, right? Yeah. But you know, step by step, we're we're trying to work our way up there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then what I really like when we talked about about it last time too is you you mentioned you you had moved around a lot, but mm-hmm. and, and then actually I haven't mentioned you're a young guy. You're you're 36 is is what I remember, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm 36. Yeah, 36. So yeah, very young and and you know high H index, very lots of published literature and everything like this, but uh, you credited your team and, and having, you know, come with you for a lot of these places. Do you want to talk about this? Even though you've been in like three, four different institutes over your career. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, I've been to different institutes following the interest and following the money, so to say, you know, at you know, which projects were, were, were available, but yeah, I've been lucky to, to have a, a pretty good core, core team that when I moved, I, I did my PhD in postdocs uh, in Austria. And when, when the offer came from Sweden, I was able to move with a, with a, with a good chunk of my team. So that was a huge, huge difference. I wasn't starting from, from zero and we were able to, we had a core group. And the same thing happened when I, when, when, when I moved here to, to Brno in the Czech Republic, that was able to somehow convince <laughs> my my colleagues that that it's worth it. So the advantage of that is that well, I mean, we do there are certain core core elements of knowledge that have remained consistent. I mean, as many listeners will will recognize, you know, if you have a lab and you have just PhD students, right? I mean, it's like a PhD student will develop some awesome thing and some some really great know how, and then we'll move on, right? Which is great, of course, right? But it's I've been somehow lucky to have like some kind of institutional know-how that's that's been able to move in a nomadic way with me. But hopefully the the last stop is Brno. So that sounds good. Yeah, you can convert your yurt, your ger, into uh, a real home now. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a, a huge thing. I mean, you not only have this institutional knowledge, you know, the the desire to keep the projects is there. You know, many times a, a student can leave, and then the next students don't want to pick up the project. And then I think another thing that's important is the the personality for some of these, I guess, processes or uh, ways of doing things is important too. So, for example, I've done a lot of clean room work and and uh, you know polyimid and stuff like this and. I don't know. Like I, I, I tolerate it. I don't love it, you know, but, but I have another lab mate who really enjoys it. And I, you know, I acknowledge like he's much better at it too than me. So, so I think there is, there is that, you know, and, and so it, it's a confluence of factors, I think too. And then obviously you have to work well with them. They have to, you know, it has to be a good mix, you know, in terms of chemistry, I guess. So I think that's, that's very important. So, okay, Eric, w- w- I don't want to, you know, cause any problems or anything like this for, for future, you know, clients or anything like this, but what do you see as the future of neurotech devices or which direction do you see? I mean, I, obviously you've talked about this, these photo, photo diodes and, and photo powered uh, yeah. devices, but is there anything else that's got you excited? Yeah, definitely. Right. So, so personally our, in our research group, right, the, the, the photo devices are really a, a, a something we're pushing. And as I mentioned briefly before, the key now is really long-term stability, right? Which is the other big theme that we we work in our group. And I think there's a lo- pretty wide consensus in the field now that people got to work on the stability, right? It's not enough to publish some cool new probe. It's really important to establish reliability of processes, reliability of materials, and really, really, really test these things. And we're pushing that a lot. So uh, I feel that that's an important part for material scientists with the same, you know, background as me in the field to really, you know, em- embrace that it's time to to spend time in, in in doing that. In terms of, you know, future, just kind of from my perspective, I mean, one area that we're very involved in as well that doesn't involve clean room, but but in the past couple of years we've been involved with, you can see maybe from some of the publications, is temporal interference stimulation. I'm not sure if that's been discussed on your podcast before. But yeah, uh, yeah you I, want to I explain think, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll quickly explain it. So, I mean, the idea is is that transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, tens, right, is very well, very well known. And one of the issues with it is that you cannot really, you cannot hit very deep targets. 
because as soon as you try to push current through the skin, you run into the high skin impedance. And before the before you're able to stimulate any deeper target, the patient is screaming because you're stimulating all the sensory fibers at the skin. So the issue is that as you go to higher and higher frequencies, as we go to kilohertz, tens of kilohertz, even hundreds of kilohertz, the, the, the impedance of tissue goes down by orders of magnitude, right? But those stimulation frequencies are way too high to cause any to cause action potentials, right? So how do you how do you bring these two things together? Have high frequencies that penetrate in, but still be able to stimulate things at low frequency. So the way that that, that we've been working on doing this, along with some other groups, is to utilize interference of multiple frequencies. So if you have multiple carrier frequencies at high frequency that otherwise do not stimulate action potentials, and you introduce a frequency offset you will get an amplitude modulated beat frequency at low frequency, right? So let's say if I have 10,000 Hertz and then 10,001 Hertz. So I introduce just a one Hertz offset. I'm going to get the beat frequency. You know, you can think of acoustics like a guitar, like at this one Hertz. And it turns out that that beat frequency can actually stimulate neurons. So you can use these high frequency carrier waves to get in, and then use this 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 the constructive interference to actually stimulate to stimulate excitable tissue, and we have been quite successful also working with several groups to bring this technology forward for both brain and peripheral nerve stimulation, and it's a very very cool area. And I'm just putting it out there. It's not I'm not our group is not an inventor of it or anything like that, but it's something that we've been involved with. And here in Brno, there's a number of groups working on it. And I think it's a very, very cool concept that might have quite a lot of impact because it basically increases the reach of tens by orders of magnitude and does it in a pain, painless way. Yeah, it is pretty exciting stuff. It, it, I love this idea of superposition and, and I think, you know, waves and, and, you know, kind of this triangulation of waves and everything like this. Uh, I think this, this could uh, allow for something like this to happen more. So I think it's, it's very exciting. I think that that could be uh, very cool, and I mean, I guess it extends the reach of tens, as, as you were saying, because because right now it's it's not as useful as it could be if it could reach much deeper. But yeah, so I think this is this is really good. I'm I'm really excited about your guys' work. I'm I'm telling everybody about it. I think obviously I'm a fan, and then so your sponsors. But I I really enjoy what you guys are working on. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? I think that we've covered a, a, a lot of ground, Ladan. Thank you so much for the invitation, and thanks a lot for what you're doing. I mean, I think it's really good for the for the community. And as I said, I I prescribe it to everyone, everyone I meet who wants to do neural interface stuff. So I kind of, you know, maybe I just quickly say, I mean, in in countries like Czech Republic, right? I mean, there's a lot of very skilled people with engineering degrees, right? So we have excellent graduates from electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on. And neural tech is not on their radar, right? Uh, and I think there's a huge untapped potential here. It's a lot of very qualified people. And that's, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do more of this kind of stuff in, in this part of the world where there's a lot of potential and a lot of qualified people to do it. So thanks to your podcast, I'm using it. I'm using your podcast as a tool to also get the word out. Yeah. Now you can, now you can put this, this episode there as, as the first one that you recommend. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I have a friend actually, he, he studied in Brno here, here in Florida, or well, he's, he's living here in Florida, but he apparently knows a lot of electrochemistry people over mm -hmm. there, over in Brno. So I, I guess it is some kind of center for that and biology yep. and everything like this. So I think, and then there's lots of Eastern Europeans, Polish, you know, Czech, Slovak people in the field. So I, I hope to one day, you know, unite everybody and, and bring it out, bring it back over there partially at least. So yeah, this has been great. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I've really appreciated this. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.